If this okay, prophecy so is so vague and is so contentious and there are so many different ways that you can do the math and do the numbers to determine if this is really a prophecy or not this is not a good way to demonstrate that your all-knowing divine god is somehow the foundation of morality especially at the cost of human well-being okay <clears throat> it's not vague because it predicts the exact year that jesus christ would die that's why it's not vague if you do the math that way there's other ways yeah, that you can you add up the, the numbers. Correctly, then yeah. Quick rundown. Yeah. Last time we had a conversation, um, you hit me with some philosophical and moral conver uh, uh, arguments, essentially, and I definitely yeah. felt a little bit ill-equipped to handle them. And then as mm -hmm. I told you in DMs, I'd like to talk to you again because although I got very annoyed and frustrated with our first conversation... Uh, I still appreciated the fact that it seemed to push me in a direction to do more research on my position, and I feel that I can uh, better argue it now. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my main claim now is that you don't need a god to have a moral foundation. Specifically, you can even have an objective moral foundation without a god. Okay. <clears throat> and I assume you disagree with that. Yeah, I do, of course. Okay. So let's like go through this a little bit here because the first question I've really been wanting to ask you is how do you know God is good? Uh, presumably because of the fact that he is the fabricator of the universe. He has the best intentions in mind and he would be the, I guess, epitome of moral prudency and um, I guess that which he can make positive or meaningful or good. Okay, so... It sounds a so little bit like what you're saying is that because he's all powerful, that uh, means he's good. No, not necessarily. I guess I could rephrase this better. Uh, morality would be relative to what he is. So he dictates morality, not the other way around. God is not uh, subject or subject to his to a moral framework. He is the moral framework. Yes, that is his divine essence. Okay, so I understand your position. I still feel like it's a big assertion, though, by just saying he's the divine essence, therefore he's moral. What, like, mm -hmm. makes him moral? You say best intentions in mind. Do you mean that he has the best intentions for humanity? And by following his morals, we would go to or we would get somewhere closer to more like human well-being, because that's a little bit like my position. Mm -hmm. We are going to get to the to the place of moral perfection if we end up following him. So moral perfection. And why do we want yep. to get to moral perfection? Doesn't this all come back to because we want to see our self doing better? We want to see humans doing even better in life? Um, perhaps. I would say, though, that might be a little bit of an appeal to emotion. An appeal to emotion to see humans flourishing and, and doing better? <laughs> Not necessarily that, but you say we don't really, I, you say we don't really need God for that objective morality, but I feel like that's strictly predicated upon one's own emotional uh, desires for humanity well, rather we'll than to... that which is objectively ingrained into nature itself. Because the doctrine of Christianity is man has fallen from the Garden of Eden, right? Um, basically, we have fallen from communion with God and we can... Uh, we can interact with God through communion of, say, Eucharist or baptism. Um, and when we die, uh, we will be given a glorified body as Adam had, as Jesus now has. Maybe not exactly how Jesus has, because he's still 100% uh, divine. Um, but nonetheless, we will be eternal apart from our own actual desires. God makes it ingrained into uh, the very fabrics of this universe, what morality well, is. I, I mean, I would disagree true. with that right off the bat because I think that the uh, objective morality that seems to be ingrained in nature could be explained via evolutionary means. But that's not what I want to get to yet because I know you disagree yeah. with me there. But yeah. I just want to start with the question, how do you know that God is good? Because it seems as though the way that you would go about assessing whether or not God is good, you have to compare God to something to determine that. Uh, not necessarily. So God is good because he is good? Uh, so a question would be for that, like, say, before, uh, 
Satan tried rebelling against God, right? And was, I guess, uh, relegated from heaven. Um, don't you think that there was nothing bad technically in existence? I mean, all of God's creation is inherently good, right? So, yeah, I, I agree with all of this, like, based on a biblical term. I mean, I don't agree with this in reality, but I understand from the, the framework that you're using. My problem is, though, is when you say that God is good and that he is the ultimate morality— Yes. What do we benefit from following that morality? You already said he has our best intentions in yeah. mind. So are you assessing whether or not God is moral to a degree based on how God's morality maximizes our own well-being? Uh, I would say that's partially what it is. Yeah. Okay. So then we can – I think we can agree with – we can start there then with the the presupposition that God wants to – God wants to better human well-being or God's morality. Yeah. So I got into this a little bit last time. I said uh, in the here and the now, the temporary time, uh, life really doesn't have all that much significance. That's not to say it's good. Uh, life is inherently good. That's not to say that, um, you know, uh, things don't matter. Suffering doesn't matter. It's to say, though, that um, if you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of your life on earth, a little bit of enjoyment on earth for an eternity with God in heaven— that's what would really matter. Like temporal uh, success doesn't matter because really well, wait, what should on. it matter if I, a man – I got to cut uh, you off here. I got to cut okay, you off here because my problem here is that the idea – the concept of eternal life is unfalsifiable. We have no way of demonstrating that heaven is real or that heaven is fake. So my problem with this right off the bat is that this world that we live in – and again, presupposing that we share a reality – um, I don't think that it's fair to say that we need to live differently if we go to heaven, because that heaven is a massive if, at least in my opinion. We don't know for sure, and there's no way of proving it right or wrong. Okay, so question for you. Say you were able to somehow objectively prove God does not exist. Would that then mean that, say, evolution is true? No. No. That would be really? – that. No, that, that would be an argument of ignorance, right? Which would be because this thing is false, that means this other thing must be true. Likewise, you couldn't say, here's evidence that evolution isn't true, therefore God is true. Just if no. one is proven wrong doesn't mean the other idea is then proven right. That's not how it works. I would I would beg to differ. I think that you can internally prove something to be true if you, if you're, if you manage to prove uh, certain attributes of an ideology to be true. Well, let's back up a second. Because you say that God wants to better human well-being. I'm cool yes. with that. I, too, want to better human well-being. So far, my morality lines up with what you are saying God's morality is. Because I, too, want to better human well-being. So the question is then, why does God support things in the Bible, such as homosexuality being a sin, uh, although I do think that that was misinterpreted, I think that a lot of people still read those verses as God condemns homosexuality. You know how about this? Let's make it let's make it concrete instead of you trying to rely on something that you think is a misinterpretation. So, uh, do you in, think in that the, the Bible culture, condemns homosexuality? This is a way for me to make it concrete for you so that we can genuinely say that God doesn't like uh, homosexual intercourse. Um, the, the the actual Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, they both think that homosexual in, intercourse is a sin and the Holy Spirit leads the church to make these kind of decisions. Okay. An interpretation of scripture. Okay, I can concede that. I don't even want to get hung up on the weeds with you. I, I don't care to argue about the context no, no, no. and whether this or not the interpretation is right. This is me making it so we can actually argue on this with the presupposition that homosexuality is a sin in the Bible. I don't, I mean, if you, that's fine. My, this is, I'm trying to go through basically like a logical structure here. So God sure. wants to better human well-being. God doesn't like homosexuality. It's a sin. However, the the conclusion here though is that empirically it's demonstrated that by accepting homosexuality, you are bettering their well-being, and by restricting them, even restricting them on the basis of religiosity, you are harming their human well-being. Okay, so sure. how can God want to better human well-being while being against something that would otherwise better human well-being? 
I think this is a baseless presupposition, mainly because of the fact that you are going along with the presupposition that what you think is better for humanity is actually better for humanity. No, right? no, no, I'm, I'm not. That's not a presupposition. This is empirically demonstrated. We yeah, have I know, decades. Hold on. I just no, want to make this clear, especially for the people listening, is that we have decades of research that shows that one conversion therapy doesn't work. Two, trying to, quote unquote, pray the gay away doesn't work. And three, when you restrict gay people's rights or you act discriminatory against them, you harm their mental health. You make it more likely they'll kill themselves and you are harming their well-being. So how can God want to better human well-being while simultaneously be against something that betters human well-being? Uh, mainly because it does not better uh, it does not better human well-being in the way that you think it does. Right. The presupposition isn't that. Accord in accordance to what you think betters human or what you think bettering human well-being is, is is whether or not it's doing that. It's whether or not what you think bettering human well-being is actually bettering human well-being. Right. You're going along. No, with it's it's uh, going the, along with how do, are we defining human well-being? If for me, yeah. if we are lowering the mental health of somebody and we're making it more likely that they'll take their own life and we're making it so that they're more depressed, in my mind, that is not human well-being. Yeah. So basically, in the Bible, God made them man and woman in the Garden of Eden. And basically what that means is that was a part of God's like like how he constructed nature for man to function in marital relationships. But right. this, no, I, I'm not disagreeing with any so of this. I've already conceded not, to I, your, I my, uh, but I've already it, conceded to your, to your presupposition that God is yeah, against no. homosexuality. No, that's not what my point is though. I'm saying though that this is the way that God intended for humanity, fun humanity to function. He can understand what the perfect and ideal society will function like, and that's in heaven, right? So, he made it man and woman for a reason. So I don't know if it's so wise for you to challenge an objectively omniscient being. But why? Okay, but then you have to acknowledge then that God is not necessarily interested in bettering human well-being. Unless you no. are going to tell me that human well-being, maximizing human well-being, is simultaneously lowering someone's mental health, making it more likely they'll kill themselves. That's the opposite of well-being. No, it's it's... The fact that humanity couldn't function in a perfect way with homosexuality ingrained into it. And God sees How? that. How so? Because I understand that because I understand. Well, I understand the contention is that better. that you probably feel as though you. I am I ascribing my secular moral beliefs onto God. That's fine. But we've already yeah. agreed that God has the best intentions for us in mind, that God wants to mm -hmm. better human well-being, but that God is also against homosexuality. How do these yeah. things add up? You're saying, well, we can't know because God actually understands the best way for society. Well, that's not what I'm saying. Well, why, then why is it that empirical evidence contradicts the human well-being when it comes to homosexuality? Oh, my goodness. I, I'm trying to explain this to you. Humanity cannot function in a perfect way with sin. But how is it a sin? How is it a sin? Because it's not according to the, to the nature that God made for humanity so they can function in perfect accordance. Okay, but you can't function in perfect accordance if you are committing suicide, if you are clinically depressed, if yeah, you are rejected no from your family and made place. being homeless. So I understand that God might have this ideal, I like this ideal way for society to function. That's fine, but it sounds like you are being completely irrational here by saying that God wants to better human well-being, but when God is against something that has already been demonstrated to better human well-being, well, that's just because God has a bigger plan for bettering human well-being? What is that plan? How are you demonstrating this? Okay, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate this to you real quick. Human beings cannot function in perfect accordance in heaven, right? Right. The, without the fall, there would be no homosexuality. Without the fall, there would be no sinful nature, right? So when you enter into heaven... You are given a new glorified body with your new glorified spirit, and you are no longer uh, bound by the chains of your sinful nature. But isn't this right? just? A, but isn't this all a massive presupposition that you're making? You're presupposing. I mean, we're not going to get into the fact you're presupposing God, but that's that's fine. I'm already on your ground there. But you're presupposing heaven. What's stopping me, for example, from saying, well, actually, I worship a God who says that if you restrict other people's rights, when you die, you will be uh, tortured for eternity. What's stopping uh, me from making the same kind of claim based on nothing but an assumption? 
yeah, what's stopping you there is like the same thing that would stop you. Like if say, it's like saying this, there's tons of mathematical equations, therefore all mathematical equations are wrong. It's kind of like saying there are multiple different ideas and concepts, therefore all ideas and concepts are wrong. This is just fallacious. There's no, there's no such thing as there's no such thing as just because there are more than one of this of things that proclaim the same thing, that means that you know it's untestable. These things are just all wrong. No, it's that what we have here is you are saying that because God cares about human well being, yes. that is why He says that homosexuality is a sin, and the reason, I said huh? I said partially. Okay homosexuality sex homosexual sex is a sin yes. and it is the the reason you are coming to this conclusion is that when we die we will not be able to be in perfect accordance with god in heaven if say you are acting in a way that is homosexual because that is against god's creation and it's against god's uh um yeah basically yeah. god's creation i under i want to make sure i'm summarizing your argument here because i think i yeah. understand the problem is is that i am able to empirically demonstrate and falsify the claim that helping or accepting gay people and accepting their uh, freedom to do what they want with loving consensual adults betters their human well-being, whereas your claim about heaven is completely unfalsifiable. I can't test that. I don't know how to prove that it's wrong or that it's right. So why should yeah, some people? So why should some people have to restrict their own well-being in the name of God? even if we cannot demonstrate that that's actually going to ultimately better their well-being. Uh, yeah, because because of the fact that it won't perpetuate right into eternity the way that God would want it to be and the way that it would functionally operate in in perfection. Right. Uh, my so sounds like here, it just so sounds like you're you're presupposing all of this. Yeah. Like if you're going to tell positions are necessary. I understand that. I'm working. I'm operating on a presupposition, for example, that we are sharing a reality. Yes, I get it. That at some point in phil uh, philosophy, you have to reach some level of a presupposition. But when you tell yeah. me that God partially wants to better human well-being, but God also partially views homosexuality as a sin, which, by trying to enforce that, demonstrably negatively impacts human well-being, how then is God wanting to better human well-being? I keep going back to this because then you're just yeah. asserting, well, because heaven, because we have to be perfect. I don't know how to prove that. You can't demonstrate this. Well, your assumption is that you can't demonstrate God in the first place. So, like, you're assuming God but not assuming the rest. It's just well, fallacious. I, I'm, no, I'm not, it's not fallacious. I'm trying to get on the same playing field with you. Obviously, yeah, so, if we wanted to go back, then we could talk about how you are also presupposing a God. You're also presupposing which God. You're also presupposing the morals that this God allegedly yeah. has. So uh -huh. there's a lot of presuppositions there, but I don't want to get into that. I'm fine for the sake of argument saying, okay, let's say that the Christian God is the real God and he yeah. wants to better human well-being. But if he doesn't like something that has been shown to uh, positively impact human well-being when you accept that thing, how then does God want to better human well-being? Yeah, because, okay, I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate this to you that in eternal salvation there is no room for sinfulness right if there's no room for sinfulness then you can't have homosexual nature that's just not how it works okay so let's go back then and, and talk about what we are referring to when we say human well-being because people yeah. in chat are rightly pointing out that i think we're we're talking past each other because we don't have a i'm talking I, i'll tell you what i'm talking about okay so then you can say yours which you've already demonstrated right i've already demonstrated mine yes which is that yeah, it's been so empirically proven to do a tangible positive or i would say tangible mm -hmm. negative harm on mm -hmm. human well-being when you act in ways to uh discriminate and restrict gay people's rights to get married and love who they sure. want to love sure um my my definition of human well-being isn't necessarily that of temporal well-being but rather that of prudency right uh, I wouldn't do something in the short term that would benefit me, that wouldn't benefit me in the long term. That's just illogical thinking. I think human well-being en encompasses that which is of the whole of e eternity, right? And this so is no it longer encompasses really eternity. eternity. Okay, I, I get yes. that. But I guess this is where we're... we're I, I think this might be why we're constantly talking past each other is because yeah. you're presupposing the eternal life. I don't have to presuppose the tangible harm done by restricting gay people. 
Sure. But, but that's on the paradigmatic level. That's why I'm doing it. Uh, okay. I, I, yeah, that's the thing is I don't think we can argue any further than this because what you're telling me is that although God wants to better human well-being and although God is against things that have been demonstrably proven to better well-being here on earth, mm -hmm. it's actually for the greater good because heaven, which is a presupposition and something you cannot falsify. Well, don't you think that metaphysics deals with presuppositions and that physics in, of it, in and of itself deals strictly with like physical ob objective rather than like that kind of stuff? Um, possibly, yeah. And also just to reiterate what I already said is I'm not saying that presuppositions are inherently bad. Of course, you have to operate on some level of a presupposition if you're even going to talk to another human being. But when you are presupposing something to this magnitude and then your presupposition encompasses negatively affecting human well-being here on Earth, then I start to have a problem and it starts to seem comp uh, contradictory. Why does God want a better human well-being while simultaneously being against things that better human well-being on the off chance that maybe heaven is real? Okay, so you're not letting me demonstrate why God is why God is has an interest in human well-being here because you're you're not allowing for me to presuppose this and internally prove this thing okay that's that's the problem here is you're you're allowing me to presuppose god but not heaven it just makes no sense all right well then let's go back to the first part the presupposition of sure. god in general how are you getting to yeah. this conclusion that a god is real which god and how the hell do you know that uh what this god wants morally if there is no consensus on which God exists and what he actually wants. Well, there's not, there's not consensus on a lot of things. I mean, just to shout down an idea because you say there's a lot of ideas is kind of, it's just an appeal to the masses in my opinion. No, 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 um, no. It's that if there is a divine creator of all humanity yes. and every ounce of the universe, and he has certain rules that he wants us to follow, those should be yes. pretty well agreed upon not, well, my God says this is good. Well, my God says this is bad. At that point, I don't know how it. we... Yeah, I know we're arguing about it, but I don't think that argument... No, that's not what I said. Okay. I said they are agreed upon. Elaborate. Yeah, the Orthodox Church has, has councils, like ecumenical councils, a lot of the time. Now, I don't know necessarily that this encompasses um, homosexuality and sexual morality in and of itself, the ecumenical councils, but a lot of these things... Um, uh, are determined through these ecumenical councils and through the majority of the church interpretation. See, in my opinion, that's appealing to the masses because you're saying because they've interpreted this way for this long, this means it's true. Yeah. They all started with the presupposition that God is real as well. There's still no consensus uh -huh. on which God is real or what that God wants. Not to mention, I can go back thousands of years and show other scholars or other churches who believe in, say, Islam who have studied this for a long time and have a general idea of what Allah wants for their life. <laughs> okay. Um, but highly, highly contend that uh, saying the Holy Spirit guides the church is like saying the Holy Spirit inspired the Holy Scriptures. Right. Um, it's, it's internally, it's an internally proven thing. It's like, it's like if I said, um, Jesus or well, how about this? I'm going to try finding a good example here. Okay. Um, it's like saying to me, prove that Adam ate the apple. And it's like, well, I wouldn't, I can't really like show you tangible or meta, even metaphysical proof of that. I would internally prove that thing to you through, through the internal consistency of the whole ideology. Right. I would pick out certain points that I can prove to you that would require a supernatural creator. Okay. I get all that. Yeah. But this is kind of my problem is that for my moral framework, I don't need to go through this many hoops. I don't need to do all these mental gymnastics and sure. say, here are the ancient church fathers who presupposed a God and they've studied this for a long time. And I'm going to presuppose that they were guided by the Holy Spirit. So therefore, I am presupposing that God exists. Now I think that God wants to better human well-being, but I'm going to presuppose eternity. And God doesn't like homosexuality because of my presupposition that eternity is real. There's not actually any firm grounding here when it comes to us having a conversation here. It doesn't feel like you're able to demonstrate this. Whereas for me, I can demonstrate. Well, you just said you couldn't necessarily demonstrate some of these things in in the like, tangible. Like, yeah, that, that that like Adam ate the apple. Sure, like I couldn't I couldn't 
show you it or demonstrate well, sure, it. That, and that's something really specific. And I don't think I, I wouldn't ask you prove that Adam ate the apple. But when we're talking about this is why gay people should essentially live a worse life here on Earth, according to your belief system and you're presupposing the existence of God, this is a massive problem in my mind. And I'll explain to you because I, I looked into this after the fact, after we had our first conversation, um, and I did some studying on philosophy and objective morals and subjective morals. And um, to I want to answer a couple things and kind of clear the air from our, our previous conversation. I know it sounds like I'm yeah. rearing off the combo, but this is this is going to come back to it. So first of all, I do believe that logic is objective as far as the process we use to come to conclusions. So long as the um, uh, beginning stages, so long as the inputs into that process are correct, then I believe that logic is objective. Yes, a spider has eight legs. A black widow is a spider. The black widow has eight legs. That is an objective process to evaluate a logical conclusion that exists with or without humans. So I want to just clear that out of the way right away. But the sure. other thing that I want to clear is that why I think that my secular moral framework is way fucking better. And that is, I'm sure, first of all, you're familiar with the whole um, is ought gap. Are you familiar with this? Uh, No. So let's, okay, I'm trying to basically bring the conversation naturally to what I'm trying to get at. But let's say that you make a statement, which is God is against homosexuality. So that's the is statement from your presupposition. That would be an objective statement. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. So then what is the follow through is that God says homosexuality is a sin. So we mm -hmm. ought not be homosexual or act in ways that are homosexual. Um, yeah, that would be objective morality. You can't get an ought from an is in secularism. Well, you can. That's what I'm saying is you, you absolutely can. And the missing link there is the want. This was solved in the early 1700s from the Scottish philosopher David Hume. I'm sure you've heard of him. Very popular. David Hume, you do realize that guy, he believed in relativism because he was an empiricist. Okay, I don't care. Either way, he started... Yeah, but he didn't solve it. He didn't solve it. It wasn't... Actually... Okay, let, let me rephrase. I may, have, I may have misspoke there. He didn't solve this, but he posited the problem of the is-ought gap. And yeah. now we have come to a conclusion later on, based on this original problem he saw... Or he posited, excuse me, is that the want is the missing link to the ought statements. So, as a trivial example, I got this from a blog. I'd be happy to send this to you. There is a cookie in the jar... That is objective. Yes. I want a cookie. I ought to open the jar. It is the want that motivates the ought. And thus you have a concrete and conclusive follow through there philosophically. That doesn't solve the problem, though. If it does. you read David Hume, it does. you would understand this. Because, no, no, no. I, because it's not just entire... David. I'm not saying David Hume is the only one who solved this or anything else. I'm saying that he no, posited he didn't the original. Okay, he, I'm saying that he posited this thing. original problem, the is ought gap, and that's part of the problem with religion is that there is an is, and then there is the ought without ever filling in the gap, which is the want. So that's, what I am saying, no want, though. There yes, no there want. is, and that's why my moral framework no, is more universal and more objective. No, which is it's that not. We that's bridge wrong. Hume's famous is ought divide. We all want, quote, life in general to survive over the long term of evolutionary time scales. Now, of course, there are some exceptions here if you're suicidal or if you have a terminal illness. But I think the um, most logical way that I could say this is that most everything that is currently alive wants to continue being alive. Sure. This is objective and universal. It's an objective and universal want that can provide a link to the morality that we all can agree to, which is Life is, life wants, wants to remain an is, life ought to act to remain so. And yeah, this yeah, is exactly what, why. and this is exactly this is why problem. my moral foundation is far more, uh, which honestly is better, and is also universal and objective. Your moral foundation yeah. requires a fuck ton of presuppositions and getting a ton of people on board with the God proposition. Whereas for me, <laughs> I can go goodness. virtually anywhere in the world and say, hey, you're alive. Do you want Do to keep I get living? To and then they will say yes. 
Okay, I want to respond to this. Uh, your major problem here is you're assuming that the problem which David Hume pro- like th- this is this is so problematic because I've actually looked a bit into this, right? And if you if you looked at the issues that David Hume took up, it's the fact that empiricism and like like earthly materialistic um, assertion of proof, right, requires so many presuppositions. Not a, like it, it requires so many presuppositions that you cannot prove like Wait. like the self like language like that has meaning yours like, requ- like no, 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 has- no 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 you, you, yours you presupposes so way more than me i'm okay presupposing that. that we all share a space and we all oh share God. reality you are presupposing an all-knowing god that cannot be demonstrated it can be demonstrated so how does my moral foundation fall flat yeah i'll tell you how because you're making your, your claim is that you solved the problem of Dave, David Hume. But if you've read anything of David Hume, his entire thing is that empiricism requires internal presuppositions that are impossible to prove through the inter- external world, right? We internally presuppose such things. Like the idea that your mind is one, like they have oneness of your mind is a presupposed thing. You can't prove that other people have oneness of mind either. Or you don't even know that other people have the same experiences that you do because it's entirely presupposed. Right, okay, and that's wait, the problem you with can't empiricism. Acu- no, you can't get mad at me for presupposing things when my presuppositions are much more foundational and are much more uh, meta in a sense. If we're talking you don't about, don't even understand the philosophy if behind it, though. Because I, you if you understood attacking- the philosophy, let me talk. If you if you understood the philosophy behind it, you would understand that presuppositional worldviews do not are not foundationalist worldviews. You have not a presuppositionalist up- worldview. What? You have a presuppositionalist yes, worldview. but I'm not a foundationalist. I believe in a web of belief, not a foundational belief. This is the problem is you don't even understand the philosophical, ideological concepts behind these things. It is, it, this is just so problematic because you have done no reading into David Hume, but you still want to bring him Stop up. Stop attacking as, the as, author. No, I brought him up as the person who originally posited the is-ought divide, which has been something that has been debated in philosophy for 200 plus but fucking years. your proposition years. doesn't solve it. Your proposition does not solve that, though. Wait, yes, it does. Because, because we can all had, universally had, agree had, that we all want to continue. No, no, no. I get to respond now. We can universally okay. agree that we want to remain life. Life wants to remain an is, as sure. I said earlier. So with that, we can then figure out how we ought to act to continue life remaining in is. Similarly, if uh-huh. all humans went extinct tomorrow, trees would still want, quote unquote, to continue living. Animals would right. want to continue living. This is evolutionary. This is natural. This can be demonstrated. And it's a better foundation that doesn't require nearly as many presuppositions as uh-huh. yours. Yeah. So I'll tell you why this is just an utterly baseless uh, assertion because you can subjectively prove an objective fact um like say through science like i can have a subjective opinion on such things and through my opinion i can presuppose a presuppose uh, sorry i can presuppose certain things um now the problem is is you're trying to objectively prove a subjective fact that we believe which does what not is the subjective it. fact that i'm presupposing the subjective fact that you're objectively proving is that we think we have some sort of a morality and therefore because we want some things that some for some reason our subjective wants equates to an objective is because that's just not how philosophy works at all. No, uh, okay, let me go back. The the uh, objective is that life is. Yes. That is an objective fact. Again, when we're talking philosophy, of course, there's going to have to be some original presupposition. In this case, I am presupposing that I exist and that other humans exist and that we all share a space. That is what I'm presupposing. And I'm comfortable making that presupposition because I find it very hard to believe that I have simultaneously come up with every uh, super smart mathematical theory while simultaneously being terrible at math. And I've written every good song and I've written every terrible song. That just doesn't make enough sense, and it's not reasonable enough for me to to believe that. So I'm comfortable presupposing that you and I exist, you and I share a space. So life sure. is. That is the objective. Life no. is. Then the problem. 
That's the, the no, no, no. I'm not saying the right entire now. thing is objective. I'm saying the objective is simply that life is. Life wants to remain an is. I would argue is probably to a degree, yes, subjective because not everybody actually wants to remain an is. But if we're talking about this on an evolutionary basis, from the smallest bit of bacteria to apes to human beings, everything that is alive wants to remain alive. I'm comfortable saying that although there is some ambiguity there, I would almost be comfortable actually saying that that was objective. So then we yeah. go with life ought to act to remain so. That is going to be subjective because how do we act to remain so? But because we have this foundation <laughs> of life wants to remain and is, we can now talk about the best way forward in order to continue and is. Yeah. So that is why yeah. my moral foundation yeah, is way more solid than yours because you I'll have to you get what? everybody to agree with Listen. your God. I don't have to get anybody to agree with anything of mine. Hunter, unless you start making some real philosophical arguments, I'm probably just going to leave because this is, it's just like your argument is monkey in my past had moral value. <laughs> like that, for some reason, that means like your worldview is at all co coherent. You said that we have axioms that we base our worldview on. You're, you're cutting out. Now, the problem... Yo, you 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 keep cutting out, bro. Yo. You can hear me? You're cut um give me a testing testing one two three. Yeah, you're 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 cutting out. Do you want to hang up and I can call you right back? No. Hello, can you hear me? I think it was just a lag like. Okay, yeah. I, I'm I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. My problem is is that you're making these sort of like very, very uneducated philosophical claims that don't really mean anything anything arguments they're non sequiturs they they just don't follow from the argument the conclusion that you have it just they're how, not how does can you can you explain to me why you are coming to this conclusion yeah your argument is that because life has had moral values like monkeys in the past that's have... not what i said i think you misunderstood my thing do you want me to re-explain sure go ahead life wanting to remain an is is not the moral thing. That is just a fact of the matter that evolutionarily, anything that is alive wants to remain so. Whether okay. we are talking about the tiny bacteria to the apes to human beings. My claim yeah. is not of a, a natural moral order amongst every bit of nature. My argument is that everything that is alive wants to remain so with the exception, of course, of some people who might be suicidal, who ultimately I think that a lot of those people do actually want to continue living. They just don't like the way their life is. But that's aside the point. The moral aspect comes into life ought to act to remain so. That is when we are able to talk about what is the best way forward for us as humans to continue living and to maximize our life. That's the moral debate. The foundation that those morals are derived from, though, is the foundational objective fact that life is and life wants to remain an is. But that doesn't mitigate the fact that it's still a subjective basis on which you're basing your morality off of. Just because you sub that just just because you objectively prove a subjective fact does not make that subjective fact an, an objective fact. What's the subjective fact? The subjective fact is that the fact is that we want to live. No, this is completely demonstrable throughout the entire, the entirety yeah, of that nature. It doesn't get an on. That does not get an on. So what is the answer then? The answer is that in a worldview where God and providence does exist, ethical claims and logical claims make sense and can be demonstrated. How can they be demonstrated? Uh, through epistemology. Like, demonstrate a moral claim for me. So I've already demonstrated it when it comes to, in regards to homosexuality. I think that it's immoral to restrict uh, gay people from living their lives freely and happily so long as it's legal and consensual because it negatively harms human well-being. And because life is and life wants to remain sure. is, I think that we ought to act in a way to continue life. So you asked me how to demonstrate uh, epistemically a moral claim, like an ethical claim. Yes, like uh, I just demonstrated mine. Yeah, so 
I'm going to use deductive reasoning here for a second, okay? God has revealed himself. He has revealed himself in ways that we can obviously demonstrate are supernatural and impossible without this sort of an entity. Uh, not only that, but this God, right, has dictated these sort of moral principles to us uh, because of the fact that he's an omnipotent being who has made it ingrained into every fabric of this universe and because it is an objective uh, fabric of himself, like it's a part of his essence, right? When you That's say it's ingrained in the universe, that could be much more easily explained via evolution. No. Not evolution isn't God. ingrained in the universe. Wait, what? Sorry? Evolution isn't ingrained into the universe. Uh, it's just something that happened inside of the universe. Uh, okay. When did God show himself? Uh, like, I can bring up the 870 weeks prophecy if that predicts the exact year Jesus Christ died. Oh, yeah, because I looked into that one, too. You brought that up last time, the uh, alleged prophecy when it came to Daniel. The thing is, though, is bef we don't really – before we get into the nitty-gritty of that is that even if there was a prophecy made that was accurate, how does that demonstrate it's a god? If we're already because... – go ahead. Because when you have an atemporal and a temporal being who lives not only within the past, present, and future, but transcendent from the very fabrics of time itself, this god can demonstrate to us – um, things that have not happened yet. Okay. But when you're presupposing something that exists outside of our understanding of time and space, yes. why can't I just presuppose that uh, future telling fairies did this? Or maybe there was a time traveler. <laughs> because that would, because it's not even implicit within the prophecy itself. It would be an irrational claim. It would be so Not if the prophecy point hypothetically point. said a fairy told Daniel that this was going to happen, then we would be believing in all-knowing omnipotent fairies? No, it was an angel that came to Gabriel in the original context that, that delivered the message from God and understanding to him. Okay, my question is, though, is that if the prophecy was fulfilled, then how do we know that was necessarily from God? You're saying because God exists outside of our understanding of time and space and he, he's omnipotent and he knows everything— why couldn't it have been a time traveler? Uh, Maybe Gabriel was a time traveler. Well, I could bring up the transcendental argument, which would rule out secularism completely. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you that it's irrational to, to believe that because it's not even implicit in the prophecy. Okay. Uh, well, I'd be happy to talk to you at some point about the Daniel verse. But e either way, I just have a major problem with your your morality or, or where let's talk about the daniel let's talk about the daniel 70 weeks prophecy i like to what is your major objection with that you texted me in the dms you said um that it has major flaws how is it flawed wait i i'm fine getting into that but i i'm at the same time not actually because we haven't really resolved this issue yeah i don't think it's gonna get resolved well yeah because you're but do you understand my my problem here is that my moral framework doesn't sure. require as many presuppositions as yours is one and two you would have to go all around the fucking world essentially and convince people not only that a god exists but that your god exists as the correct god yeah yeah so so to get universal your... objective moralities we would need to first convince everybody that god exists my okay, moral yes. foundation uh... doesn't require that and on top of it if God does one day reveal himself as saying, I am God, I am objectively real, here I am, come out and look at me, nothing changes with my moral foundation. Uh-huh. So this is where the, the whole thing about <laughs> um, the prophecy comes in. You're asking me to go prove that this is my specific God. That's why I'm bringing this up. Okay. Right. So, so the, the prophecy of... Uh, let's see. Is that if you look at it and, and the dating that was done, this is according yeah. to, hold on, let me see. Wikipedia? No, it says, Dr. Leslie McFall of Oxford. 175 BC because Antiochus Epiphanes was referenced in the prophecy, right? Is so, that what it is? Well, no, some people think that the verse was actually referring to Nehemiah, not Jesus. Nehemiah, that's... Because Wait, the even, 69 even, weeks forward is argued yeah. that that is telling the future, but the 70, the 77s, meaning 70 years, was actually yeah. talking about the past, not the future. 
you um <laughs> you do realize the, the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy was written in 530 BC. Nehemiah lived in 444 BC to give the command to effectuate the prophecy. I mean, it's I can send you this. About... It shows the charts and the dating and how it would would line up to that. And yeah, it's, the problem it's is that a lot about... of people are trying too hard to insert Jesus into every single into every single text. It's talking about Nehemiah and Jesus. Nehemiah is the person who starts the timeline. Uh, uh, yeah, the okay. commandment to restore Jerusalem. It says, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah uh, shall be given 69 weeks, right? Uh, so 483 years, and uh, he will be killed on the 69th week, 483 years into the future. Right after the commandment is given yeah, by but King Arthur, that dating is super controversial. As well. no, the way that they counted time in those ancient times is also hotly debated. When he says 77, does he mean weeks? Does he mean years? When he's talking 69, no. does that mean weeks? Does that mean years? The reason that some people argue that the prophecy was actually later added was because Daniel 9 was written in a different type of Hebrew than previous verses in Daniel. Yikes. Uh, yeah, I've heard this claim before. It's, it's a really, really bad claim, especially because I don't even think it's a different kind of Hebrew. Uh, I think it's a different kind of Aramaic and a different kind of Greek. But those all have actual reasons for them being different, namely being that for like the Greek specifically, it being different. Those were the names of instruments. So, of course, it would the things would keep their, you know, uh native tongue the the instruments themselves and there's there's many other different different things and different reasons for these but it doesn't really even date it to a later time uh okay let me just read you this little excerpt here from the dr leslie mcfall who was from oxford uh, the two findings of this paper are first that the 70 weeks of Daniel 924 refer to the past 70 years of the Babylonian exile, not to the future. And second, that the period of 69 weeks, 69, huh, was intended to mark the coming of a Messiah. And that Messiah was Nehemiah, not Jesus. Only when Nehemiah is seen to be the Messiah of Daniel 925 does he provide a starting point for a different 70 weeks of years, which ended in the coming of the greatest Messiah of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. But this calculated 70 weeks of years is nowhere mentioned in the Bible, 70 times 7. Jesus' Jesus's coming is hidden behind Nehemiah's coming. It's shadowy, not explicit. Nehemiah is the overlooked stepping stone to Jesus. One cannot fault the eagerness of previous commentators to see Jesus in every scripture, but if he is forced into places where he is not intended focal point, then this distorts the original meaning of the text. Yeah, so I'll tell you why that's really, really bad uh, of an interpretation. Uh, mainly because Nehemiah is the person who gives the commandment to restore, Jer or who is given the commandment to restore Jerusalem, right? If you know anything about the prophecy itself, um, mm -hmm. Right, so I'll go to the prophecy in my Bible real quick. <clears throat> so it says, it says, You shall know therefore and understand from the going forth of the, com of the word to be answered to, and to rebuild Jerusalem, Christ the Prince, uh, there shall be given seven weeks and 62 sevens. It's saying, after, like, you will know commandment to restore Jerusalem is given, uh, it will be 483 years after the rebuilding of Jerusalem until the Messiah comes and he will be killed. Was this the That's 70? Pretty... Was this the 77 thing or was this the 69 one? This is the 69 one. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So let's see. The conclusion of this section is that the 70 weeks of 924 are unrelated to the 69 plus 1 weeks of 925 to 27. The former refers to the past, the latter to the future. This constitutes a major point of disagreement with modern treatments of Daniel 9. So... There are, there are massive amounts of, of holes with this prophecy, essentially. No, is that, not. Yes, there is. Is no, that one? No, you have to demonstrate that. No, You've only no, I have absolutely demonstrated it by showing the way that the Hebrew, or what you said, the, the other language that they were using, was completely different. There was from... only Hebrew in this prophecy. I've read the prophecy in Hebrew. Okay. The Hebrew differed in Daniel 9 from the previous yeah, parts of Daniel. So let's let's demonstrate is this. Is that true or I'm false? No, it's, I'm going to bring up the Masoretic. You cut out again. Uh, 980, right? These are compiled in 980. These are the Hebrew texts that the KJV at least translates from. We don't use this in the Orthodox Church all that much, uh, but it's still useful. 
Um, so let's oh, okay. go ahead. Wait, and... no, we. Don't, I'm not. I'm not loading up the original Hebrew on screen. I'm just not doing that. Because You're even if I you, no, because even if I were even if I were to concede, even if I were to walk back that assertion and then concede that it was actually all in the same Hebrew, it doesn't change the fact that my overall contention with not only biblical prophecy, because there are a fuck ton of biblical prophecies that never have come true, but there are also problems with the fact that this is so hotly debated. A prophecy from an all-knowing, divine, omniscient God should not be so open to interpretation. <laughs> it shouldn't be so hotly debated among <laughs> scholars. This should be clear and concise because true prophecies, quote-unquote, are a claim about when something will happen, exactly yeah. how it's going to happen, and then it does. There's no actual is... proof, one, because you cannot uh, falsify the claims made in Daniel 9, and then two, there you is so much them. no, you there's so much them. contention no, when it comes them. to this. You can falsify them. How do you falsify them? You can't just say, because the Bible said this, then the Bible said that. No, you can, you can show how it is not dem demonstrably true historically according to the historical dating of the text themselves and not demonstrably true according to the actual fulfillment of the prophecies themselves whether or not jesus christ died on the cross but you would be a muslim to suggest that he didn't because all historical no uh, I, I recognize that somebody named jesus existed that's fine but my problem again no, is the way that they measured time is up to debate and a lot of people, they try to read this and then make it fit so that Jesus fits into the chronology of the biblical verse. When no. according to what we have, according to what we know, that is up for debate. I'm not necessarily saying it's not a prophecy, but I am saying that if this is a prophecy from the divine all-knowing God, it shouldn't be this fucking confusing, this vague. And when you have a vague prophecy like he will be the anointed one who will then die— what does that mean? That could be interpreted anyway. Somebody's going to interpret that as meaning Jesus. Other people have interpreted Argument. it as being Nehemiah. You, you, I don't care. Just because people disagree with each other doesn't mean all disagreement and all points of contentions are wrong. Unless you start making real arguments about this and like what it actually says, I'm just not going to I'm not going to bother with you because my argument is a that a, a prophecy from a divine God would require multiple things. One, it would not be so vague. It's not vague. Really? The anointed one will die. A new covenant? What does this mean? There was somebody, that's you know, not, who came that's just... not vague at all. Wait. Yes. If we're vague. talking... Hold on. If oh you're talking goodness, about the Daniel... That's not vague. If you're you talking about 927, the leader making the covenant with God's people was actually suggested to be... I don't know how to say this name. Antiochus? Antiochus? He Ant desecrated the temple and stopped <laughs> the daily services being held there for exactly three years. Okay. You have... This is just ridiculous because... You don't understand the chronology of, of the text itself. Just because it says, or prophesy, yeah, I do agree. It's it's prophesying about Antiochus Epiphanes, Nehemiah, and Jesus Christ. But just because it does all three of those doesn't mean the entirety of the prophecy is predicated upon Nehemiah or Antiochus Epiphanes. Because they're just a part of the of the chronology itself. Like, I don't think you have an actual understanding of what the prophecy entails in and of itself. My my understanding is that this is prophesying when Jesus is to start his uh, mission or his movement and then when he dies. But my contention is yeah. multiple things is that one, the reason I'm bringing up that there is a lot of debate about this is not as an argument that it's wrong. It's that this casts doubt that this is somehow a prophecy from an all-knowing divine God. If God wants us to know him and he wants us to follow him, then why is he making these quote unquote prophecies that are so hotly debated? Why has the Bible in its entirety not been preserved? There are so many questions that I have in regards to you alleging People this comes from a divine other, spirit. People no. disagree with each other, therefore the Bible is wrong. No, that is just, the claim is that if making, this is from God listen, Almighty, there shouldn't be this listen, level Hunter of disagreement, Avalon. dude. Listen, Hunter Avalon, make some real arguments or I'm about to dip because these are not real arguments. The, the prophecy mentions one person doing vague things. And so now no, it applies to Antiochus, it also applies to Nehemiah, it oh. also applies to Jesus, and it depends how you do the math when no. the 69 plus 1, this is bullshit. Oh my God. That's not you. You just you just don't know how to conduct anything. It's like saying the same thing for evolution because there's more steps for it, and because you need an inside understanding of it. It's it's not saying it's not prophesying when the when Antiochus Epiphanes is gonna do so and so. It's not 
prophesying that Nehemiah is going to die on the cross or, or not on the cross necessarily, but he's going to be killed by a government. It's prophesying all of these things and different aspects of them in accordance to each other. It's like me saying, um, okay, so as soon as this uh, uh, commandment from King Artaxerxes goes out to restore Jerusalem, Nehemiah is going to be the starting point for that. And then about 483 years after that, Jesus Christ is going to die. And by the way, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is going to commit the abomination of desolation. It's a very coherence. Wait, uh, I'm reading movie. Daniel 927 right here. And he yeah. shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. So That's it's not talking about his death and resurrection. Yes. No, but you said that it's prophesizing uh, Nehemiah and also Antioch or Antiochus, yeah. however the fuck you say that guy's name. So how is it saying he as a singular, but it's actually prophesizing multiple people? This is what I mean with yeah, the vagary. You're able to just no. make it fit no matter what. Let me show you something real quick, okay? It's saying, he shall confirm a covenant uh, with many for one week. Uh, my sacrifice and drinking oblation shall be taken away, uh, and there shall be in the temple uh, in the temple the abomination of desolation. Right. It's saying there will be the abomination of desolations. That's talking about the Maccabean period with Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. Right. But it's also saying Jesus Christ is going to confirm a covenant with many. Right. He's going to die and resurrect. But that's completely separate from the timeline in and of itself. It's not a chronology there. The chronology in and of itself is from verse 24 to 26. So when it's talking about verse 927, which I thought was like the the well, I guess it's the whole Daniel nine, which is the prophecy. When they talk about making a strong covenant with many for one week, yeah. you're conceding that that was actually referring to Antiochus, not Jesus. No. Because you realize that the leader making the covenant with God's people appears to be Antiochus, who desecrated the temple and stopped the daily services being held there for exactly three years, according to Josephus. But it's Josephus. not a chronology. But that's, not in, that's not in chronological order. So it's supposed to be... This is... Can you please fucking explain that more so? Okay, yeah. So it's like if it's like if I set up a really in-depth timeline, and then after the timeline and the preceding verse, I make a bunch of claims of things that are about to happen, but I don't necessarily say them in order. Okay. Yeah, this is this kind of goes back to what I said already, is that when you have prophecies that can be applied to virtually anything and can be used to fit anything, you kind of come to fitting a square into the uh. circle hole. And this is the exact problem that I have with quote unquote biblical prophecies. If this oh. pro hold on, you realize the big problem here, right? Is that you are saying that this prophecy shows that God is real, which is why yeah. we should then base our morals on God, which simultaneously yeah. includes harming human well being. If this okay, prophecy so is so f vague and is so contentious and there are so many different ways that you can do the math and do the numbers to determine if this is really a prophecy or not this is not a good way to demonstrate that your all-knowing divine god is somehow the foundation of morality especially at the cost of human well-being okay <clears throat> it's not vague because it predicts the exact year that jesus christ would die that's why it's not vague if you do the math that way there's other ways yeah, that you can you add up the, the numbers. Correctly, then yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like saying to, to a kid, uh, yeah, one plus one equals two, and he says no, it's one, and then you say, uh, and then the kid says no, 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 uh, there's ambiguity here. We just don't know anything then, uh, and it's not true, and blah blah no, blah. No, that's not says, what it is. I'm not says, saying ambiguity says, is what. Well, no, you have to. Listen, and the dad says you gotta do you you gotta do your mathematical equations properly, kid. Otherwise, you're just making uneducated assertions, right? Yeah, it's, but but that's not coming from a divine, all-knowing God. That's, no, this you're is the problem. The ambiguity bad. alone, in and of itself, is not necessarily the problem. But if this is from a divine, all-knowing God who wants all of us to know Him and follow Him and follow His morals, then this prophecy should be a hell of a lot clearer than this. We shouldn't be able to debate this for the last 30 fucking minutes. It should be crystal clear what it says, what it means, and how it came true. Instead, you have a lot of contention. You have debate. You wonder, how did they actually do the math? Could you have done the math this way? Why is Daniel 9 written apparently different from other parts of Daniel? Why do some people suppose that maybe this was actually put in after the fact, meaning a post-eventum uh, prophecy? There are all kinds yeah, of questions here. And then... On top of all of this, to kind of 
start pivoting away from this because we've been now going in circles. There are a fuck no, ton of you've been you've been going in circles. Your your arguments are just baseless. You're just throwing things out there, and then when I ask you to prove them or substantiate them in any way, shape, or form, or have it internally consistent with itself, you just deny it. Like like you said that because this is divinely inspired by God, and people disagree on it, and because there's ambiguity uh, in the scholarly opinions, that means such and such, and that it's internally inconsistent. Therefore, it's not reliable. But that's not at all true. It would actually make sense, and it's internally consistent that these things are as such. I feel like you're not you're not understanding my actual argument here. Like I am understanding someone actually in chat made a good point that mathematics have clear rules, right? No, they don't. Yes, they do. They have clear rules that you abide by. And secondly, you don't claim that mathematics are coming from a divine, all-knowing, powerful God that if you don't follow, you will burn in hell for eternity. That's not what you're saying when it comes to math, okay? But when we're talking about prophecies, there are a fuck ton of ambiguities here and ways to interpret this to mean virtually whatever you want it to mean. That is my argument. My argument is not that this prophecy is incorrect because people disagree, lol. My argument is that if this is from a divine all-knowing God and we're supposed to use this verse to figure out that he actually exists then this should be a hell of a lot clearer. And then on top of all of that, you have a fuck ton of biblical prophecies that have never come true, that have just blatantly not happened. Okay. Uh, you know, I would ask you to substantiate that, but I also I will. Have some... I already know uh, a, a prophecy that's problem, very crystal clear that never fucking happened. The, the problem here with your whole mathematical thing is that's actually been disproven. It's not all completely 100% transparent. It's not 100% all the time objective. I can't remember the name of the specific equation uh, problem or formulation, but there was a problem. I'm not getting into the, to argue about math. I'm not doing it. It doesn't matter right you're now. Not, you're the not the thing, all, because, all I'm showing. It's not objective then. No, not what objective, I'm showing but... you is that the example that you used was disanalogous. Math has no, a clear not. set of rules and standards that you as a, no, you as a student have to abide by the standards and the rules that are set for you in regards to math. Prophecies are way more open to interpretation. <laughs> Listen. Math is, is not problem. open to interpretation the same way that a fucking prophecy is. Are you there? Did God, did God silence you? Hello? Hello. You you cut out there. I, I'll have to wrap up the conversation soon, but I would wait. Can you still hear me? Hello, hello, I'm hello, here. hello. Sorry, um, I don't. I don't yeah, so, I thought God struck you down there. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, you you say that math is objective and it has an objective meaning and it needs to pro be properly interpreted, but you're not willing to actually go through and argue for the proper interpretation. I never of once gravity. said that math was objective. I never said this. I said that if you are making a comparison to a student that says, I don't believe in the one plus one equals two, that's not fair because there is a set standard applied to math that you must Wait, abide you by. you that math is objective? Are you like a solipsis? Sil Holy shit. Okay. I don't know why. I actually know what I do know why you're trying to pivot away from this subject, but let me just no, go I'm over one more prophecy that clearly never came true. No, why don't I'm you go to your you. Google and type in Isaiah 17 1? Sure, let's go over to this. Isaiah 17 1. Actually, I'll just bring it up in my Bible myself here. Okay, I'll read it to my stream. A prophecy, and I'm reading the NIV, so whatever. A prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. The cities of Eroer will be deserted and left to flock, which will lie down and no one to make them afraid. The fortified city will disappear. So it's predicting the fall of Damascus. Yeah. And now Google is Damascus still a city. Yeah, I, I don't. I haven't done any research on this, so you'd have to get back to me on this. I, I'm just showing a very clear-cut example as to how this prophecy never fucking happened. What so, is it? So it says it should be deserved. Um, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know necessarily what it's even talking about. You'd have to get back to me on that. Okay. All I'm saying is that if you're you're gonna predict or appeal to the Bible that has these yeah. uh, prophecies in it, then there probably shouldn't be 
a fuck ton of prophecies that also didn't come true, like saying that Damascus okay. is going to fall. It's going to be unable to be in. Uh, um, it's not going to have people living in it. But yet you look and Damascus is still standing and it's one of the oldest cities to exist. And it has an estimated population over two million. Yeah, I would have to look into that. But that doesn't invalidate the actual prophecy that I had at hand. I know right. it doesn't, but your it, it, refusal to walk through the prophecy and understand it is not my problem. That's, that wait, seems like a huge problem. Wait, I know. I'm not saying that this prophecy not coming true debunks the other prophecy. I'm saying that it's not that impressive if you're appealing to a divine God who made one prophecy that can somehow be interpreted to have come true, yeah, while there I'm are a lot of other prophecies that never came true. Yeah, but I'm using this prophecy in specific. You cut out again. That that doesn't make this prophecy. That doesn't make this other prophecy any like less valid. It makes the yeah. Actually, you know what? It does because if you're no, saying that an all-knowing, omnipotent God, omniscient God, is able to make prophecies, then why are we only able to look at one prophecy that appears to have possibly come true and ignoring all the ones that God also made that didn't? I'm come not true? ignoring them. We're just talking about this one. Okay, but I said we were. Gonna, I'm going to move the conversation to a few prophecies that never came true, which casts no, doubt I on want, the validity I, of the God that you're appealing to. Do you want me to tell you why you're just – because I, I think this is a good place to end it probably because you're just not making arguments here, right? You, you had a complete refusal to actually walk through the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy and for me to explain to you why these other interpretations of it are wrong. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. You're just refusing to walk through why these other no, interpretations are I'm not. Are wrong. I, I, listen, I'm not. All I was saying right. is so, that there so is a. All I'm saying is are... there are contentions with the one prophecy, and even if you were able to demonstrate that that one prophecy came true with 100% certainty, it still takes away from the credibility of the God allegedly giving these prophecies. Because there are a fuck ton of other prophecies that allegedly God gave that have not come true. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Hunter, I don't know if you know how a, an actual debate works, right? Um, at least like a formal debate. But when I ask you in DMs for sources and stuff, and I will give you my sources and arguments if you give me yours, right? So we can critique each other's on the spot in the debate. That's how... Uh, you're might cut out again. No, I know we're not having, and when we're not having a formal give... debate here. We're talking on my fucking live stream. So either way, this is why I wanted to have another conversation because I knew that once I actually looked into this shit, that we would, that I, I knew that a, 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 uh, um, new conversation would be better because I am able to now look into the claims you made. And I realized that there is a fuck ton of issue with it. So no, I'm not going to believe in a God or presuppose a God based on this one prophecy that can be interpreted as possibly coming true and in doing so restrict human well-being and restrict gay people from living their lives happily. Oh so thank goodness. you very much for your time and I'll see you later. All right. Mind you, this isn't the only prophecy that hasn't come true. Now, some people in chat are saying, well, time isn't up yet. I'm sorry. That's not a real prophecy then. Sorry. That's not a real fucking prophecy. If I say, one of these days, New York will crumble. What? Well, okay. Maybe in the next 3,000 years, New York won't be here anymore. Have I made a prophecy? No. You've just said something that could happen and then wait waited out long enough that it's probably going to happen. <laughs> Not to mention, there are a lot of other prophecies that have never come true either. This is why, by the way, Jews don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. These are some of the prophecies the Bible says the Messiah will meet. Build the third temple. Never did that. Gather all Jews back to the land of Israel. Never did that. Usher in an era of world peace and end all hatred, oppression, suffering, and disease as it says, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall man learn war anymore. Uh, last I checked, that's not ha that has not ceased. War is pretty common, sadly. Spread universal knowledge of the God of Israel, which will unite humanity as one. Like what I'm saying, if this is the divine God, why has he not made himself known across the board so that we can actually go and follow him and do things that he wants? 
As it says, God will be king over all the world. On that day, God will be one, and his name will be one. If an individual fails to fulfill even one of these conditions, then he cannot be the Messiah. Because no one has ever fulfilled the Bible's description of this future king, Jews still await the coming of the Messiah. So there you go. I'm glad that I had a conversation with this guy again, because last time we talked, I didn't really have a good understanding of philosophy, and I got a little bit flustered because I wasn't sure how to respond to everything he was saying, but then as soon as I looked into it, I was like, holy shit, this guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. I'm just glad, I, I'm just glad it's over, okay? Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click the bell so you get notified when I drop a new video.